Hi everyone, Dr. Green here, and this is the first of our two lectures on the women's Indian captivity narratives for our English 451 class. So in gathering together the materials for this semester and in envisioning how it was that I wanted to shape our reading list, uh, one of the things that I wanted to do, one of the goals in terms of setting up this anthology of different readings and different types of readings that we're doing is to try to get you a sense of some of the major voices in early American literature and for you to see how those voices interact with, compete with, and dialogue with each other. And in some cases tell very, very different stories about the same period of history. So in this particular case, it's not uncommon that some of you may have encountered some of these captivity narratives, especially if you have an interest in American literature. I would assume that if that's the case, you probably would have read either Mary Rowlandson's account, uh, possibly Hannah Dustin's account, but the rest of these are probably more unfamiliar. And I think that it is an interesting genre, and it's one that tends to get overlooked in studies of early American literature. Again, a lot of times you might see one of the, the narratives, but that divorces it from the larger historical context context of these narratives, and I think that as a whole they provide a very interesting insight into women as authors, who has authorship over a biographical text, and I think of course that you also get the conflict with Native Americans that you see coming through in pretty much all of these. There's maybe one or two where the people who are taken captive uh, sympathize or completely integrate with their captors, but more often than not it's very antagonistic and that in and of itself is important to look at. And I want to start by kind of reminding you to always take a look at the artwork on your the front of your books. And I think that this particular picture that the editors of this edition chose to use for the cover is very telling. Uh, you get the credit for the back of it um, on the back of your book, excuse me, the credit for the image. And I think that the way that the image is composed is kind of a great way to start to think about the way that these narratives are composed. You'll notice that the woman is very much lit at the very front bottom um, here. She looks very vulnerable, which is a common theme in a lot of these narratives is the vulnerable woman. Uh, the Native Americans are against this very dark background, so it makes them appear even more menacing as they sort of come out um, and after her, they seem to be coming out of that dark background as they go to, presumably, they're going to scalp her and kill her. So she has that expression, again, of, of looking up as if she is looking up for help, looking up for divine deliverance. And this is, again, kind of the pattern that a lot of these stories take. So I think that that choice of painting is very apropos to what it is that we're going to cover over the course of the next couple of weeks in these captivity narratives, narratives excuse me, themselves. All right. So the first part here is going to cover up through Mary McKinnon's uh, account of being taken captive. But before we go there, I want to go ahead and start by giving you some background information and also by giving you some things to think about as we read through the text, things that you might be considering, things that you might look for, not only within an individual narrative, but also as a compare contrast. And then also in comparison to some of the other texts that we've read, for example, Puritan theology, comes into play with some of the narratives. And of course, we spent the first weeks, couple of weeks of our class looking at Native American culture and looking at their own stories. So we see how these are conflicting and competing voices um, as we move through these first several weeks now um, of the class. All right, so what is unique about this as a genre, the captivity narratives, is that it was dominated by women. And we have to be careful here. Most of the narrative, well, most of the narratives are about women who are taken captive. There are narratives about men who were taken captive, but those don't seem to have been um, as interesting to audiences at the time as the ones that were written by women. And what we're going to see and what you should watch out for is how it is that these narratives are specifically shaped to gain that kind of readership. Some of these, like the story of Mary Rowlandson, were wildly popular. They were considered bestsellers at their time, and that is saying something considering that the printing press was not exactly the most efficient thing at the time. And these were still wildly popular stories, very, very popular. So you have to ask yourself, well, why is that? 
Well, if you're going to look at a story like this, audiences took to that image of the helpless frontier, you know, the helpless colonial woman who was at the mercy of these savages. That was an interesting story, and that tends to be a lot of the pattern that you're going to see. Woman is taken captive. Normally, she has children. In a number of cases, some of the children are murdered uh, almost immediately, and in a lot of cases, the women are recovering from childbirth. Um, there's several who have very, very young infants at the time that they're taken, um, so that adds that level of vulnerability. So they're mothers, they're wives, they're vulnerable. Many times they're also very pious, they're very good, um, upstanding sort of women. Some of them, like Mary Rowlandson, are explicitly Puritan in their beliefs. Others are Christian. Um, we also have one of the women who is Quaker. But nonetheless, we get that sense of building a narrative of a woman who is taken at the height of her vulnerability, who often has to deal with the loss and the death or the injury of children, who is left alone and cut off from the men in her life like her husband, and she must find a way to survive. As a part of that, she shows that she is a good Christian woman uh, by always looking either to providence or by essentially being thankful for the hardship because the hardship is teaching her to be better. That is a standard pattern that then ends with the woman reunited with her family and with white culture. Again, there will be some distinct variances from that pattern, but that is sort of the standard pattern that these stories tend to fall into. Uh, it is not only a, an interesting genre because it is dominated by women, um, but I said we have to be careful because although the characters are women, there's probably not a lot of these stories that were wit written by the women firsthand. Many of them were actually written by men, and many of these men were ministers who wanted to shape these stories again into that larger pattern of perseverance under duress and holding on to one's faith. Some of them may have been written by women. Um, for example, Mary Rowlandson, out of all of these, was, was fairly well educated, so she might very well have been able to do that. But even though these are about women, and they sometimes tell the story of the women in the first person, that doesn't mean that the women themselves wrote their own story. So again, we have to think about that idea of appropriation of a woman's story, and what it means that a male author would appropriate a woman's story and then retell it in a way that obviously he would see fit as an author. Okay, this is also, the, the captivity narratives are also a uniquely American form. Remember that as we look at the development, especially of early American literature, we don't necessarily see a lot of things that we might think of when we look, for example, at the literatures of European countries, which had obviously a much longer history to develop. As such, we start to see some very interesting things form with regards to uniquely American narrative. One of the uniquely American forms that we see is the captivity narrative. And of course, that's by virtue of uh, the colonial, the establishment of the colonies, and then eventually interactions and conflicts with Native Americans. And then, of course, the push west, which moves Native Americans off of their lands and, again, highlights uh, struggles, tensions, and in some cases, all-out wars between the burgeoning American government um, and various of the Native tribes. Okay, so in terms of looking at the narratives as a history, they actually lasted in popularity for, for quite some time. Um, from the 16th to 16th century, so very early in the, in the American colonial experience, all the way up through the 19th century. So we, we continue to see them crop up throughout that entire time. The earliest of the, the, uh, the earliest of the captivity narratives in the 17th century and into the 18th were primarily in this mode of being religious and trying to deliver, in some cases, very explicit sermon-style tones and, and moral messages. As we move into the 18th century, we start to see more propaganda against Native Americans that begin to come in to the stories much more heavily. And then by the time we reach the later accounts in the 18th and 19th centuries, this is where we really start to see fully fictionalized accounts. And, and your book gives you at least a couple, um, I think maybe a couple three, uh, where one we know for sure is a complete invention two of which we think are likely completely fictional inventions. So we move from literature that is based at least nominally on the accounts of these women to accounts that are complete, complete works of fiction. We might call them historical fiction, which is a genre that has become very popular 
well, it has resurged in popularity, I would say, um, today. But nonetheless, we see that pattern evolving here. All right, so like I said, the religious stories especially tended to be shaped or interpreted uh, by these male ministers who saw value in taking these stories and using them as a means to teach um, good Christian behavior or good Puritan behavior. Specifically with regards to Mary Rowlandson, her, she and her husband and, and really seem to have been more calculated in terms of looking at her story seeing that it could be fit into this larger Puritan narrative of hardship, keeping the faith, and then the divine providence sort of delivering Mary. And they seem to have deliberately worked to shape her narrative to fit that particular form. And her husband used her story in many of his sermons as a teaching tool. So again, it, that, does that make it propaganda? Yes. But does it mean that the narrative is wholly false? No. But does it mean that we can have trouble determining the entire authenticity of all of the details? Absolutely. So again, that is always a problem. Authorship and the extent to which they are 100% truthful is always a problem. But that's not necessarily um, specific just to a captivity narrative. Anytime you get an autobiographical account, there is the opportunity for the author to shape his or her life story in a way that fits some sort of a larger narrative purpose. But that, again, doesn't render it false, but it means that we have to be aware of that as we come through and read these. All right, so in terms of what this really meant when we talk about uh, people, white people, being taken captive, it looks like there were probably tens of thousands of uh, white settlers who were taken prisoner by various tribes over these centuries of the captivity narrative. So over, oh, about what, about 17th, 18th, 19th, about 300 years of history, 250, 300 years of history. Um, for the most part, and I know that a lot of the narratives, <coughs> excuse me, um, do speak of people being killed during these raids. And obviously when there was conflict coming up to the point where people were taken captive, that certainly makes sense. However, it seems like ransom, which you see come up quite a bit in the story, where various of these women will talk about how the, um, the, tribe, the tribes will tell them flat out, we're going to try to ransom you for money. That seems to have been a big motive. So they would take prisoners... And a lot of times they did take these prison, they did keep these prisoners in really good shape. They treated them well because their value had to do with ransoming them for money. And money was power. And certainly at this time, Native American peoples are being increasingly encroached upon. So again, ransom was a primary motive. Um, the other interesting motive that we see in a couple of the stories here in the book, but also more generally in the historical record, is what is called about what is usually called transculturation. This is when somebody was taken captive with the express purpose sometimes of them replacing a lost family member of a, a given family within a tribe. Perhaps somebody was killed in an encounter with the government. Perhaps somebody was simply just lost to sickness. So captives might be taken in um, specifically as replacements. And also sometimes some of the captives chose to stay with their captors and decided that they did not want to be reintegrated into white society and they were happier remaining among the native peoples. This is interesting. And again, it's not... We're not focusing on this specifically, and we could probably spend weeks just talking about this in and of itself. But it is interesting that for many of these tribes, and you're going to be you you have some examples that will come up in your reading, um, when they were replacing lost members of the tribe, it is very interesting that they did that without a sense of discriminating against race. There were often, there may be some sort of trials that the person would have to go through. There may even be some long period under which they were expected to learn to conform to the tribal customs and behaviors. But once they were accepted into the tribe and they became sort of an official part of that tribe, they were not seen as different necessarily because they were not of, they weren't blood. They were essentially racial outsiders. Uh, there are often, there are, not only were there whites who were adopted into the tribe, there are also some instances where, um, African Americans, sometimes perhaps even escaped slaves, were also adopted into tribes. So it gives us kind of this very interesting um, 
insight into views on race at this time. And that is especially interesting because racial history in early America certainly doesn't really go that way. Um, this is still, for the most, most of our readings, we are in an active time of slavery. And clearly Native Americans weren't in any kind of significant way welcomed into white culture, although obviously there would be individual people who didn't hold discriminatory views. But again, it's such a fascinating perspective to think of these people being transculturated into these tribes. One of the last, uh, last couple of points that I want to make before I um, begin to point out things in the individual stories themselves, one of the, the things that first came up about the captivity narratives, and I think that this idea still persists, is that we can look at the captivity narr narratives, some of them anyway, as ethnography, meaning that we as readers can learn about Native American cultures and some of their practices by reading these stories. That really, I think, is a little bit problematical, and there are a lot of scholars who believe that the captivity narratives as a whole only masquerade as ethnography, that they are, instead, with the exception of those who might have transculturated and were recounting their stories, these were written by people who were complete cultural outsiders. So their ability to give an accurate rendition of what it was that was cultural tradition, why those traditions might have existed, etc., is much, much more harder to pin down um, and to say with certainty, yes, we can read these texts as ethnography. The last thing that you might want to consider is, are these tales, do these tales exploit the women who are their main characters? That is another major point of debate, and I think it, I think maybe you'd even have to go from story to story and determine how much the woman herself had an input into the way that the tale was shaped, what it was that she gained from it, etc. So these are the main questions that are um, surrounding us as we begin our readings. So on that note, we're going to start with Mary Rowlandson, and I'll point out some of the things that I thought were of interest as I read and then, of course, have reread. Um, her story. Now, her story, as I said earlier, is definitely shaped by Puritan ideals, and she and her pre her husband, who was a preacher, used this as an instructional text um, for bearing hardship. It was published in 1682 and was considered a bestseller, um, an early American bestseller of its day. And her particular capture was the result of increasing colonist encroachment into native territory and the rebellion of three of the tribes into whose territory the settlers were encroaching. She was held from February to May of 1676. Um, and it's, it was hard for her as a whole because when that initial raid takes place and it's that chaos of that moment, remember that defeat in Puritan theology meant that God was displeased. So she has to try to contextualize, okay, well, white people are supposed to be superior, but they've just gotten slaughtered. She's been taken prisoner. Um, one of her children is grievously wounded. Another has been killed. She's been taken from her husband and doesn't know if she's going to be killed. That would have to lead her to the conclusion that God is displeased either with her specifically, her family, her community, or whites more generally. And remember, they were always trying to read the signs to try to figure out what it was that God had wanted. Um, all right, so as we look at some of the examples, if you go to page 7, um, as she begins her preface to the reader where she lays out how it is that all this came about, um, towards the end of the second, um, excuse me, the first full paragraph, she says, as it was not difficult to be foreseen by those that knew the causeless enmity of these barbarians against the English and the malicious and revengeful spirit of these heathens, so it soon proved dismal. I point that out to you because she describes this as causeless enmity. Uh, we know from the historical record that it wasn't, it wasn't causeless at all, that there were absolutely reasons why it was that the tensions had been increasing. But again, perspective we have to watch for because it biases the interpretation of the historical events. As you move on um, to page 8, it's very interesting that the first part of this is really focused through a male lens, Joseph Rowlandson, again, who is her husband. And as page 8 unfolds, we really see as the language is shaping, that this is being set up as a story of perseverance and deliverance. And we see words like um, the cup of common calamity. We see a reference to Lot. We see references to how it is that she has to, um, how it is that this has to be persevering through this terrible, terrible thing. 
um, that it is hardship to be born. All right. Um, page nine claims that the, the, this narrative was penned by this gentlewoman herself. Again, she was more highly educated and more affluent than some of the other women in this book, so that is entirely possible. But it's also clear that her husband also had a clear hand in shaping the writing of this narrative. Certainly thematically, but I would suspect also in terms of the actual physical act of writing it. All right, so as we move forward then to page 12. Um, we can see that this unfolds as a one-sided narrative, and this is, with little exception, this is a trait of all of the captivity narratives. They very rarely will at all sympathize um, with the Native peoples as a whole, although sometimes in some of the stories, and even Mary Rowlandson sort of grudgingly does this a little bit, um, they will point out that not all of the Native Americans were quote-unquote savages. So there is this tension there with how to describe these Native Americans and how to do that, um, how to do that in a way that would still keep to these larger themes. Um, on page 13, what is interesting about this is we can't underplay the horror of this moment for Mary Rowlandson. Again, she was an, an upper, a wealthier woman, a more affluent woman, the wife of a minister, and I think any of us would be in an utter state of chaos. So she is hit. Um, by one of the bullets in this firefight, it goes through her side and then wounds, um, seriously wounds, um, and fatally wounds, unfortunately, as we see, um, the young child that she is holding in her arms because of the way the bullet has penetrated through her and into the baby. So not only is she in this state of chaos, but she is also herself wounded, and she is now dealing with um, a grievously wounded um, toddler. And she's told on page 14 that if she comes along with them um, quietly, and basically if she agrees to go along, that they won't hurt her. And again, part of this is because someone like Mary Rowlandson is more valuable being ransomed than she is being killed. All right, and as we see on page 14, um, Rowlandson gives us this very interesting insight into her own character. So we have these places where she is showing her own flaws in some ways, perhaps as a um, the wife of a Puritan minister. She says, I had often said, I had often before this said that if the Indians should come, I should choose rather to be killed by them than taken alive. But when it came to the trial, my mind changed. Their glittering weapons so daunted my spirit that I chose rather to go along with those, as I may say, ravenous bears than this moment to end my days. So we have this interesting moment where before she would have said, no, I would just die. But then she says, you know what, when I was really faced with it, I was afraid. And part of that also faces, um, feeds into that idea of this being ultimately a story about perseverance and deliverance. All right, on page 15, you really start to see as um, the story continues that she focuses a lot on her identity as a mother. Again, this, this proved to be a very popular trope with readers. And it also, as you can imagine, brings a lot of sympathy to Mary Rowlandson as a character as we can picture her vulnerable herself and then also vulnerable by virtue of this in, this wounded child who is who is clearly suffering um, terribly and suffers terribly, I would imagine, unspeakably so, um, because this is a very horrible wound. Um, the way she describes that the bullet has gone into the child's bowels, so the child is is dying slowly, and it is it is very unpleasant for us to think of, um, and obviously also unpleasant for her to have to contend with. On page seventeen. Um, the child ends up lasting for nine days uh, before finally dying from the wound. So this is, this is a terrible moment. And I think at the one hand, you see her emotion in that and you see her emotion um, that's in here. But in some ways, I think you also see what a lot of critics will remark on in a number of these captivity narratives as being this kind of strange emotional detachment. Some some critics and scholars will chalk this up to the fact that this was trauma. And many times when we write of trauma, we necessarily distance ourselves from it um, because it is so painful. There are others who say that it is because many of these narratives were shaped by men and the men chose not to focus and emphasize on sort of womanly emotions and focused instead on other details. So again, I think personally that it kind of depends on the story whether or not that's uh, whether or not that's the case. All right. So as we go through 
her, the rest of her captivity. For example, on page 19, there are small, small favors or small kindnesses that are done to Mary Rowlandson. For example, she is given a Bible to read, um, which she claims is of great comfort to her. Um, but we also see contrasts, for example, on page 20, between someone like Mary Rowlandson and women like uh, good lady Jocelyn, who is not able to bear the fullness of her captivity um, and ends up dead. So again, not all of the people that she talks about are able to contend with their captivity. One of the things then, if you move to page 25, that becomes interesting about Mary Rowlandson's ability to endure is her ability to procure food. She's very shrewd. Um, as much as these were stories about women um, who were vulnerable, because that was what readers really enjoyed, you can also see that Mary Rowlandson is very shrewd. She has a talent for sewing, and this is the type of skill that makes her valuable amongst the tribe members as she is being um, held in captivity and then over the course of the removals to different areas. She's asked to make different garments, she's asked to repair garments, and she's able to barter that skill as a means to get food so that she can survive. So she, as much as she sort of is at the mercy of this overall circumstance, she figures out pretty quick how to survive. Um, and I think, again, it's a testament to her, um, to her cunning and her ability to know what it is that she needs to do um, to survive. All right. So we know on page 27 that one of the goals, again, that the natives have is to sell her. Um, when she goes into the wigwam, she's told um, that these particular women want to try to buy her. Um, so again, money and the ability of them to get money for people like Mary were very important. Um, and ultimately, the most money in this particular case is going to come from Mary's husband and family um, ransoming her back to them. Um, this happens, um, obviously, towards the end of her narrative. And on page 50, as it comes to a close, she reflects and essentially gives us what sounds a lot like a sermon and a moral message at the end of the story. She says that she has, I have seen the extreme vanity of this world. One hour I have been in health and wealth, wanting nothing, but the next hour in sickness and wounds and death, having nothing but sorrow and affliction. And she says at first, and towards the bottom of page 50, that at first this is what she wanted. She, had, she felt she had led too easy a life and she wanted affliction. She wanted God to test her. But when it came to the testing, she admits that it was not an easy thing to do, but ultimately, again, in shaping this Puritan message, she endured um, and through providence uh, survived. Okay, so the next narrative that we have is, her is Hannah Dustin's. Hannah Dustin's is crazy and it's short, um, and it is completely different in tone in many ways from um, the relatively submissive uh, Mary Rowlandson and other women that we meet. Uh, Hannah Dustin was not a higher class woman. She was not a respectable lady. And it seems like there was a lot of maybe petty crime and other things in her family that would not have made them, um, it would not have made them particularly, um, these were not sort of the people you would look up to. Um, Hannah was captured in 1697. And her story itself obviously wasn't written um, by her. It was written down by Cotton Mather, who used it and seems to have um, used it as a preaching tool. Um, but Hannah is quite different. Um, Hannah seems to have had very specific reasons for taking the kind of bloody revenge that she and the other captives do at the end of her story. Um, you're told that um, on page 55, but it's also reconfirmed within her narrative itself. Uh, Indian scalps were worth money. Hannah was not a wealthy woman. And again, in terms of her shrewdness, she um, scalps the Indians when she's given the opportunity so that she can sell the scalps for money. Um, many, certainly Cotton Mather shapes the story of Hannah Dustin as one of a woman who overcomes terrible adversity and takes her revenge. She does take her revenge, but again, it seems like it maybe wasn't so much revenge as it was an opportunity to make money. Um, on page 58, we do see that Hannah was vulnerable. Um, she had, um, she says that she had been having lain in about a week. 
that is a um, that is a description of the time after childbirth where women were recovering and were basically sort of bed bound. So she's only given birth about a week ago and all of this calamity sort of happens and that infant is killed. So in many ways this becomes something like a revenge tale and certainly it is in the way that Cotton Mather shapes it when we're told at the top of page 59 that they violently um, smashed the baby against a tree to kill it. And that seems to be a common description of the way that these infants were killed. And there's some debate about whether that actually happened or every single time or whether that became an expected mechanism by which these you know poor innocent children were killed. It's hard to say, but that is the account that we are given here. Um, and one of the even worse things on page 59 towards the, the bottom part of the page um, about this is that not only is she taken captive, um, but they've been, but they're Catholic. They've been apparently converted into, um, she talks about the, the Catholic missionaries. So she is not a Catholic, obviously, and being Catholic in, to the Puritans was a terrible thing. So it's kind of made, there's two sets of enemies here. The Native Americans themselves who take her captive and the Catholics. And you'll see the Catholics come up again later on in one of the other narratives. Um, basically, the story ends almost as quickly as it started on page 60, but this is where we see why it is that she might have taken the scalps. Uh, she says, but cutting off the scalps of the 10 wretches, they came off and received 50 pounds from the General Assembly of the province as recompense for their action. So this wasn't a small amount of money at the time, and so again, they could have just escaped. They escaped in the dead of night. There wouldn't have necessarily been reason for them to have stayed around and risked uh, being discovered, but the money seems to have been um, a very attractive reason to try to scalp um, the Indians, which they um, successfully do here. All right, so we move to the next story, which is the story of Elizabeth Hansen, who was taken captive in August of 1724. So again, we are quite a number of years before America even becomes America. It is still a series of colonies under the control of the crown. Elizabeth Hansen is different because she is Quaker and not Puritan. So you want to, again, you want to keep that in mind. And this is an interesting story because she is bought by a Frenchman who eventually, um, within six months from the time she was captured, he then ransoms her back to her own family. So again, this ransom business with having prisoners was making a lot of people a lot of money. So we can see why it was that this would happen. Um, this seems to have been, um, again, a very popular, popularly printed captivity narrative. It seems to have been fairly widely um, written, or excuse me, widely read, not wi widely, widely written. Um, as we go through this, and we start to take a look at her story on page 66. Um, you'll notice that this is another one of those places where a male is writing down her story. We're told um, which relation, as it was taken from her own mouth by a friend, who would be a male friend, differs very little from the original copy, but is even almost in her own words. And so the question that many critics ask is why is it that these women were not given uh, more agency to shape these stories themselves as they saw fit? Now clearly literacy would be one real problem, but that initial opening line tells us that there was alteration to the story because it's only sort of mostly true, not completely true. And the tone is very interesting. The tone sort of takes on what is often described as a very dispassionate tone. Um, whether that is a result of the male, the, the male writer shaping the story or whether Elizabeth Hansen detached herself from the events, that becomes, I think, in a lot of ways horror, uh, harder to say. Um, what is interesting is on page 67, Elizabeth, we do see some of the conflict as Elizabeth Hansen watches her own child be killed. She says, I bore this as well as I could, not daring to appear disturbed or show much uneasiness, lest they should do the same to the other. That is a terrible thing. She is a mother. She has just witnessed one of her children be killed. But again, with that sense of cunning and shrewdness, she thinks, okay, if I protest or if I 
if I react in such a way that my surviving child acts up and starts to cry, I might lose them both. So these are terrible positions for women to be in. These are terrible things for any mother to be in them. And I think that in my reading, Elizabeth Hansen, to me, comes across as a much more vulnerable figure than, um, certainly than Hannah Dustin, um, but also, I think, more vulnerable than Mary Rowlandson, who seemed to have much more of a degree of cunning in terms of how she could survive. Um, Elizabeth Hansen um, seems to not be quite as able to do that on her own. Um, as we move to page 68 and on to page 69, it is interesting that she begins to sort of speak of um, this, this native who has captured her, and she talks about the fact that he offers kindnesses. For example, he will sometimes offer a blanket. He will sometimes help her to cross this very rugged and rough terrain. But we have to wonder um, how much this might be some sort of a Stockholm Syndrome, because she also admits that he is prone to wicked, wicked violence sort of out of nowhere. He seems to have a very explosive temper. So in some places, she seems to say, okay, well, here are the kindnesses he gave to me. And in other places, um, we see that um, he is very unstable um, and certainly is prone to violence, especially towards her. Um, we also see through this description on page 68 and 69 that these native, the natives are very able to survive within their environment, even as it is changing and even as they are being encroached upon. They can survive in this territory, and she is sort of completely at their mercy because she does not have those skills. She doesn't have an ability to survive. And as we move through to the top of page 71, she makes this interesting comment that at least amongst themselves, she says, these people very, being very kind and helpful to one another, which is very commendable. So again, we get this kind of, we get these little glimpses of the ways in which the natives interacted with one another. But again, do we want to call this ethnography? That might be um, a little bit more tricky to do and a little bit more tricky to defend given the ways that we know that these, shape, these texts were shaped and given the fact that they often were not written by um, the women themselves, at least not fully. Um, On page 73, and then pretty much in these the next sections of the story, what I find interesting is that the, this, this man that she calls the ma her master, at some points, again, she, um, she seems to defend him. At other points, she is very critical. Sometimes she'll say, well, he gets violently angry, but only when he isn't successful hunting. It's a very interesting thing, and I wonder, you know, is this how, as a person being held against one's will, is this how a person would contend with that, day-to-day -day and moment-to-moment -moment inability to predict what was going to happen. She didn't know if he was going to come in the door angry or happy or with food or without food. And I think the narrative is very much shaped by that and those elements remain. Um, as we go through onto page 77, we have a reference to the um, once she is uh, taken by the French or ransomed um, by the Frenchman. She says, the French were civil, um, beyond what I could either desire or expect. But the next day, after I was redeemed, the Romish priest took my babe from me, and according to their custom, they baptized it. The Romish are the Catholics of, from, from Rome. Not, um, so again, we see again that there is not only tension with the natives, but for some of these people, there was also tension with other religious groups, in this case, the tension between the Quakers and the Catholics. All right, so the story ends with her sort of recounting sort of the rest of her life and um, the death of her husband and sort of ends again with a kind of moralizing note. Okay, so the next of our stories then is the Panther Captivity, as it is often called, written by supposedly by a man named Abraham. What is it Abraham? Abraham Panther. This is the one text that pretty much universally scholars believe, and I think that there's it, it, it sort of bears itself obviously so. This is the one that is obviously invented. Um, it is complete work of fiction. And what's interesting is that it's got a violent heroine um, like Hannah Dustin, who is not afraid to use a weapon, um, not afraid to use um, <laughs> not afraid to use a melee weapon. Uh, but it's also got these weird elements of fertility myths, which not only have obviously have 
traction in some of the Native American stories, but some of this even seems to be going back to conceptions of the green man um, and fertility figures like the green man. It's, it's a very interesting and sort of, I think, kind of completely wild sort of a story, but it was very, very popular. Um, it was published, um, I think your editors say something like tw in excess of 20 times, which is quite a bit at this time. So this was the, this was the type of story that um, early readers were really um, captivated by. Um, it starts out on page 86, and I think this is where we can really see that it is an utter work of fiction. It kind of has the same convention, even that something like Rip Van Winkle sort of has as a convention, where it sort of is found in someone else's papers. In this case, it's a letter written to somebody about, oh, well, here are the events that you wanted to hear about. I've written them down for you, which is supposed to give it that sense of verisimilitude. Um, I think that that sort of gives it away right away as a fictional account trying to pass itself off as, an, as a work in this captivity genre. Um, the first thing that these men describe as they're moving through, um, they had been going west, and now they're, they've they've come back home, is they find this beautiful young lady um, at the mouth of a cave. A cave is a typical fertility symbol. It is a symbol of the womb. It is a symbol of a womb-like space. We can even take this all the way back to something like the Odyssey, where the woman Calypso um, lives on the island, the, the, lives on what is called Ogesia, and it's basically a cave, the navel of the earth. And so this is very much a fertility symbol right away. Um, she invites the two men into the cave, and I would encourage you to read this allegorically, that these two men are taken out of their environment by the strange appearance of a woman who takes them into this odd space um, that becomes even odder as it goes along. But it's also interesting, and the men don't seem to think it very strange, that a woman who is single and otherwise vulnerable takes two strange men into her home, such as it is here, um, when that would make her vulnerable potentially to sexual assault. It's a very, it's a very odd story. Um, it's very melodramatic as the story goes along. And on page 88, um, she talks about how... By day, the spontaneous produce of the earth supplied me by, with food. By night, the ground was my couch and the canopy of heaven my only covering. It, it feels almost like these cycles of the seasons, these cycles of abundance. It's, it's very odd. And what becomes even odder is this account that she gives of um, the man of a gigantic figure walking towards her. Um, basically, as we see on page 89, this figure, who very much is in line with a lot of these stranger fertility figures, seems to want, um, first wants to sleep with her, and then she seems to understand that she will be raped by force if she does not comply. Instead of complying, she takes that sense of agency and takes up the hatchet and kills him. And then ceremonial, ceremonially disembowel, dis embowel, well, not dis I guess she doesn't disembowel him, excuse me, but um, cuts his body into pieces. There's something that is ritualistic to this. There are many, many stories across cultures of the ritual dismemberment of fertility figures for the purposes of the continuance of the species or for the continuance of the cycle of rebirth. And I think that for whatever reason, the author of this particular story um, wanted to tell kind of this mythic fertility story, but wanted to make it more popular by having the main character, this weird woman, having been captured by natives, because that's really the only thing that makes it anything like any of the other narratives that we've read. All right, so let's move on then to the story of Jemima, uh, excuse me, of Gemma, Jemima Howe, uh, who was taken in 1755. This is much more of sort of a standard story. It, it doesn't, the Panther narrative is kind of in a weird place because it's sandwiched in between two of the more conventional stories and it in and of itself is kind of wild um, as one of these narratives. Um, on page 96, what is interesting is that this narrative is, it seems to come from this external place. It's, narr it's narrated externally um, and it seems to, it seems to put a a barrier between us and Jemima, but also seemingly between Jemima and her own story. And again, it is an interesting feature of this story that it is told in that particular um, 
particular manner. Um, as we move on on page 98, it's very interesting when she says, um, she at length set off with me and my infant tended, intended by some male Indians upon a journey to Montreal in hopes of finding a market for me there. There is this very interesting theme of the commodification of women in a lot of these stories. Mary Rowlandson was valuable because of her ability to sew. Other women, like Jemima Howe, are valuable as a commodity because of the price that can be gained by selling them. It's a, it's a very interesting, it's almost like this trade in women. Um, and obviously what, what kind of strikes me is that now we have this horrific plague of women and of women being trafficked and of human trafficking. In many ways, this strikes me as an early form of that, except obviously here, mo most of the time it wasn't for sexual purposes. And most of the women do not appear to have been raped by their captors, but they are being commodified and sold for their value as money. Um, as we go on here and we uh, finish out this particular story, um, she talks of, um, on page 101, where she is finally taken and, as she says, is placed beyond their insolent power. So, again, these are not usually positive accounts of um, the Native peoples who are here. All right, so the last of the stories in this section is the account, um, is the narrative of, of Mary Kinnon. And again, it it's probably wasn't written by Mary Kinnon. And this has a really different tone to me um, than the ones that we've seen, as we see on page 109. Whilst the tear of sensibility so often flows to the unreal tale of woe which glows under the pen of the poet and the novelist, shall our hearts refuse to be melted with sorrow at the unaffected and unvarnished tale of a female who has surmounted difficulties and dangers which on review appear romantic even to herself. This is a much, stylistically, this is much different. It doesn't have that sense of remove that a lot of these stories have had, that sense of detachment. Um, and it's very much almost this kind of pr pr prose where it's just sort of hard to even get off of the tongue as we try to read it, and as I even as I try to read it and to share parts of it um, with you. So... This is another one of those stories on page 110 where the woman, Mary Kinnon, has borne witness to the depth, um, to the deaths of her family and the, the deaths of her children. But as we go on to page 111, there seems to be a lot of emphasis on the landscape and on the natural landscape as they are traveling by foot, much more so than what a lot of the other women focused on. They tended to focus not so much on the beauty or the remarkable nature of the landscape, but more the fact that the landscape worked against them because it was a hardship for them to be moved sometimes very quickly as they were fleeing um, as they were fleeing white troops who were perhaps trying to rescue them. So here we have this emphasis on this landscape, um, the hunting, all of these different sort of elements um, that don't exist in some of the other stories that we've seen. On page 112, um, it seems to also speak as a kind of guide to manners to women. And this is on the last full paragraph that starts on page 112. Um, here, the female sex, instead of polishing and improving the rough manners of the men, are equally ferocious, cruel, and obdurate, as she speaks of these, um, who she calls the squaws. And that's a, ter that's a terrible word. Um, that's something akin to a racial epithet, but we see it throughout um, the literature of this time in terms of whites describing um, Native American women. So it seems to be an instructional manual on proper manners for women, even in hardship. And then on page 113, we perhaps see the other main purpose that this particular text has, which is being very much anti-British. Uh, towards the bottom of page 113, Britain is sort of anthropomorphized. O oh, Britain, how heavy will be the weight of thy crimes at the last great day. Um, so this seems to perhaps be a little bit of propaganda against the British. So I think in a lot, compared to the other stories that we had in this week's reading, this one is the strangest in terms of the style that it takes. It also not only has some of these commentaries on manners for women, but then it also uh, focuses on the landscape. And then it also, again, seems to be a propagandistic text um, to raise hatred against the British.
So, okay, I hope you enjoyed this first set of readings, and I hope that you enjoyed the variety even within the confines of the captivity narrative that we've seen so far. All right, I will see you guys in the next lecture.